All right, y'all. Bearded Bros Golf Show. Introducing ourselves. I'm Rod. And I'm Marcus. And we have a special guest this week. Talking about opportunities for young people. Oh, yeah. That's the best one, I think. So, College golfer who's featured on our thumbnail, and that is Michael Pimentel. He is a D1 golfer at Southern University. Mike, introduce yourself to the crew. Hi, Ray. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Pimentel. I'm a junior here at Southern University in Baton Rouge. Uh, it's a pleasure being on here. Thank you, guys. You know, you got the, the beard going, so you fit in with us. You're not a complete outcast, so welcome, welcome yeah. on in. I'm the third beard. No, it's just I've uh, been trying to get on here for a while, and y'all y'all keep telling me no, so <laughs> that's all right. All right, so you're you're the you're the bearded stepbrother. Um, Mike, what did you see uh, from Tiger uh, from your perspective? Um, I thought Tiger looked good. I mean, swing looks good. Ball striking is good, like Marcus mentioned. Um, the short game's coming along really well. I think with him having to rehab so long, you know, that's the only thing he could do is chip and putt. Um, Putting really wasn't wasn't that big of a deal. I mean, he annihilated all the par fives all three days. I mean, he made he was pretty much under for all the par fives. So I mean, that looked really good. Uh, driving distance was crazy. Mixed bag. Yeah, I saw that. The driving distance was definitely there. Yeah. A couple of bad. The back nine par fives jumped up yeah, on him. Number eleven. He didn't like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I mean, the power is still there. The athleticism is still there, and I think. Uh, even Charlie has a big influence or a big role to play as well. I mean, even though he's behind the camera, you know, backstage, but Charlie pushes him every day and he's out there. So he looks really good. Uh, I mean, the best thing to hope is that he's still healthy to play once a month. You know, that's, that's the biggest thing is can tiger remain healthy for that once a month to, you know, perform in these big stages or in these big tournaments that he, wants to play in so I'm, I'm i'm excited to see what he has in store i mean um i honestly think he he has a chance to win something this year with the way he looks at the beginning of this year it's just that that third round it looked like he was pushing his irons a little too far he was you know blasting it past every green but it just shows that the athleticism is still there the power is still there and you know we could see maybe another tournament or another major out of tiger so i'm excited yeah, i agree um looked hell i mean the he clearly still in the weight room. My guy That's, still yeah. looks jacked, <laughs> bare, looks barrel chested. Buff. <laughs> yes, yes. Did you see him walk in today? Yeah, yo, oh, the, sleeve, the, the sleeveless with the shirt, Nike, crazy with the slim yeah. fit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Somebody asked me on my timeline. They was like, "How old is Tiger again?" I was like, "He's forty seven. Please relax." Yeah, you, you can't Please tell relax. until he takes until he takes the hat off. Then when then you truly know he's forty seven. But <laughs> another return that I didn't want to gloss over and uh, was Will Zalatoris. I think he ended up you know finishing dead last. Uh, the the his back return his return after a back injury and recovery and a switch up on putter. Um, Clearly still trying to figure the game out. Did y'all get a chance to, even though he wasn't featured much on TV early on, but uh, catch any of Will's Alatoris, Mike, did you see any of him on screen this week? I did. I did. Um, I caught a couple of highlights of Will. Um, I think uh, he's in that stage where he's trying to figure out what is good for my back, what isn't good for my back. And I think uh, I know my, I have gone through that. Marcus has gone through that where back problems can end your career or it can halt your career. Um, so I think, I mean, with the surgeries he's had, he, he's mentioned that they've been successful and they've released some of that pressure from his lower back or from that specific area of his back um, that he just has to retrain those muscles and just, you know, find a swing that's comfortable. Cause I mean, if you look at a swing, it's not, it's very traditional, but at the same time, just how his back is at setup, you know, it's not a, a, a spot that looks comfortable or it looks appealing to everyone else's. I mean, he's the only person I know that really hunches his lower back or he arches his lower back to, you know, to create his move. But I think um, he's going to figure that out throughout the season. He's a great player. Um, the putter change, I, I think he should have st- stuck with his original putter, even though his, like, three-footers are a little shaky. Uh, we're still we've seen shaky, that. man. Yeah, we've seen that still. Stroke. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think he should have stuck with his old reliable and, you know, just ironed it out. But, you know, those guys have a, a whole team of personnel that, 
you know, they pay thousands and thousands of dollars for. So he trusts his camp. And the only thing we can do is just see how he does throughout the year and how he progresses throughout the year as well. Yeah. I know they were talking about him getting a little more rotational, um, you know, not as much constriction on his turn. Um, that's, I know that's how he generated a lot of power as a pretty slight guy. So um, you saw a little more turn from him this week. So as he gets adjusted to the swing, we'll see how the success um, either comes or doesn't come. If, if you've been a longtime viewer, you kind of know where Marcus and I stand on live as a whole. I just did want to get your feelings, Mike. You're a little bit younger than the both of us. What are your thoughts on the whole live situation? And do you think it's good for the game? Do you think it's, you know, what do you think of the format as a whole? And what do you think about its involvement in the game of golf at this current time? Um, well, at first when live did come out, I thought, I thought it was a joke. I mean, it's, I mean, are you kidding me? You're you're playing half the events on tour, and it's a third it, it of just did, by the way. Or th- yeah, or it just didn't really scream to me. Like it wasn't like, oh, I want to go to a live tournament, or I want to. But at the same time, you know, I think live really attracted an audience where every tournament is pretty much a party. So it's you know where the PGA only has one tournament, which is the waste management, where you get that kind of environment. And I think live what Liv kind of did and what we kind of don't see is that they attracted an audience that enjoys that kind of rowdy loud life or, you know, event like the waste management. And they do that week in week out. Um, so I think they did capture that audience and that, that is great for the game of golf. Um, and also it's not like we're, we're out here seeing a bunch of wash players. I mean, we still have lots of big names in that field, like Dustin Johnson uh Sergio Garcia yeah. walking so yeah to a certain degree I mean the back half of the league is pretty washed if you if you ask me yes there's there's definitely some names but that second half and when you, we're going to get into it the event the qualifying event that they have coming up here next week as well some of those names I'm just like wow if that's what they're recruiting but I, I get what you're saying in terms of it, it brings in a new segment. And to be honest with you, you know, anytime we post a live clip or talk about live, I feel like all 15 fans that are watching on CW end up in the comment section here, um, you know, just really trying to encourage us to give it a shot, which I have. And right. I think that's the interesting part is that we've really taken the time to sit down, watch it, analyze it. I've talked about the business side of it that. I'm I'm having a hard time seeing it, but I think Rom, if he ends up migrating over, definitely changes the equation for the PGA Tour and for Liv and his trajectory. Because you know he's not going to be the only one going to be making that move. So, Mike, have you actually? How much have you actually watched of Liv? Sat down, tried to find it on CW or when they were streaming last year. Man, I think I've watched maybe half a tournament. A couple of a couple of tournaments here and there. It is okay. again. It just really never caught my eye. Hard to catch your eye when we don't even know what channel CW is on. Yeah, but um, I think so. You they, don't have you're, you're not fundamentally opposed to it. It's just not something that you're going to seek out. Is that fair? Yeah, I, I, I'd say. I mean, I've had multiple conversations with a lot of friends and coworkers about it, and a lot of these pros have made these decisions to either you know, it's a financial decision or a family decision. So I think that, right. They'll, they'll, right. The, you know, that the only thing we can do is respect their decision, you know, and of course a lot of players on tour are not a big fan of that decision, but you know, they don't know what's going on in their lives. I know a lot of them are friends with some of these individuals and they respect their decision and they decide not to speak out on it or they're just kind of over it. Um, so like you, like you mentioned, Jordan Spieth really being really vague on it. Um, but again, it's it really comes down to their decision and their choice. Like D- Dustin Johnson's decision was he wanted to play less golf. So I mean, that's his choice. You know, whatever. <laughs> right. You know, he he so, stated it. Yeah. So in a couple of years, so you're a junior in college right now. So a couple of years, you come out, and I'm assuming you want to continue playing golf as long as you can. Correct. Absolutely, yeah. Even if they, you life. know, going into the professional leagues. So that's an. Mm-hmm. That's an aspiration of yours. If given the opportunity, let's say Liv throws you a contract for, I don't know, 500K to, you know, over three years, 
you know, enough to keep you eating, get your finances taken care of to move around. And then, of course, there's guaranteed winnings just for playing in a tournament. Is there anything fundamentally opposing you from going over there and, and taking on that opportunity, if that's the best route for you to continue playing golf? Um, well, to me, I see golf as golf, you know, as long as I get to enjoy playing the sport that I love, you know, that golf is golf and people will not like me for going to live or if, you know, if both the PGA tour and live offered me, I would take the PGA tour just because of, I mean, I grew up watching the PGA tour. I grew up watching those greats. I, you know, they, every kid's dream is to go to the PGA tour, but if, you know, I don't, succeed on the pga tour i don't get that opportunity to be on the pga tour and live offers me you know I, I just see golf as golf and i love the game and i want to play it as long as i can or as long as you know my body lets me um so to me golf is golf i mean my dream has been to play in the masters and to play at the u.s open and to really one day hopefully be a major champion uh whether it's in augusta georgia or you know, wherever they're having the U.S. Open or the PGA or, you know, go across seas and win the British Open. And um, I mean, to know that this other league will strip me of any chance of doing that, it, it's kind of a decision that is it's not an easy one to make. I mean, most of those guys on live like have won major championships. They they their name is out there. They're done They're They got it. So for someone like me, I that's why I'm so heavy towards the PGA tour because without that, I don't get into this. So I think for those younger players, they need a, that's a big decision that they have to make knowing that potentially I may not ever play in the masters or I might play in the masters, but it won't, but I have to be a champion first. So it's, it's a tough decision that all these professional golfers have to make. And I think they really sit down with their camp and their people and say like, you know, what are we going for the money? Or are we going for the legacy? So I yeah. think that's what it comes down to. I think that this comes down to a generational change that we're still in the middle of. I, mean, I mentioned Tiger earlier on being the model. The PGA Tour is what people know up to this point. Correct. Liv is only a few years old at this stage, you know, two years mm -hmm. going into their third year. And so, I mean, I know they're trying to forge the team thing and have kids coming up being aware of Liv. But that takes a, a whole generation to sift through. So I don't know. I know the acrimony and struggle with kind of the back and forth has, unfortunately, I don't know, it's kind of aggravated me with golf, you know, and I've become disillusioned to kind of the fighting and the comment sections here and there. So let's hit a quick hitter on the live subject before we move on um, out of that. But this week on the DP World Tour, dueling events again. One in South Africa, the other in Australia. The Australian event, a mixed event with the ladies and the men, which was cool to see them playing on the same course, although Definitely. you know not playing in tandem. So that was cool for them to get highlighted and to go back and forth in the coverage. I thought that was pretty damn awesome, to be real with you, um, on the Australian side. So we had Yako Neiman in Australia taking the title. Siwoo Kim, early in the week, looked like he was... Going to go on the back-to-back -back wins, wasn't able to pull it off, you know, struggled on uh, the third and fourth day of the tournament after taking an early lead. Um, but Yako Neiman getting his, um, you know, win over there in Australia, a live guy. And Dean Burmister um, getting his second win in a row in South Africa, another live guy. So them essentially, you know, them definitely getting some world ranking points out of their play these last couple of weeks. Um, you know, any comments to add to that? I mean, congrats to those guys. Winning is winning. And, you know, yeah. if you could, it's hard to win golf tournaments. Yeah. Um Especially back to back weeks, as Siwoo Kim showed, but Dean Bur Dur Dur Dean Burmester really pulling it out um, on the final day. Any comments on on those two situations before we segue out? Actually, there's an interesting story about Joaquin Neiman and that win. Um, he was actually ranked 82nd in the world, uh, and then after he won, he ranked 59th. But he's still shy of that Masters invitation, and that <laughs> yeah. hit him in the tail. Um, so, he, I mean, he was he was excited that he did win the Australian Open, but he was just kind of sad and frustrated that he couldn't 
qualify for the masters. And I, and that all comes right, right, right back to live. You know, he made that executive decision. He decided to go to live. And um, again, there's no hate on him. I, I love to see a Spanish golfer in the field whenever, because unfortunately the Spanish community really isn't in that big in the golf or big in on the PGA tour. Um, so I was happy to see a, someone Spanish win or a Hispanic win. Uh, it just, I, I, my heart goes out to him cause he was, he was a couple, couple places shy of, you know, going back to the masters and, um, you yeah, know, I well, still wish. Him, l- let yeah. me ask you, does he have any additional opportunities to, to gain points? I, I mean, I'm assuming he's going to keep trying to play overseas as much as possible to try to hit that. Um, did they speak about any uh, additional opportunities that he had upcoming? Um, to uh, achieve that? Not, not, not that I know of off the top of my head, but, um, okay. I think I think there still are a couple tournaments out there where he could maybe jump a couple more places and get in. But um, golf ball rollback. This is the last bulls crap topic for the week. Um, you know, we talked about this earlier in the year, and you know when it was first announced, and they were talking about there being two versions of the golf ball: one for pros, one for amateurs. The golf, the amateur golf ball seemed like it wasn't going to be affected. And you had all these manufacturers come out and say that they were not willing to put in the R&D to develop two different types of golf balls that the money that they were going to have to invest and lose behind the development, you know, didn't make sense for them. So the RNA and USGA came back and said, hold my beer. We're going to just screw everybody. You know, I'll ask you, Mike, first, just because you're a, I'm playing with you, you're a long hitter. Um, what do you think about the distance rollback and how it may affect your game? And do you, you know, I, yes, it's going to be universal, but I also think they're going to have people out there playing old golf balls. And I don't know the way they're going to plan to police this. And true enough, it's like eight years or five years out. Um, I think for amateurs, it's 2030. So what do you think about this change? Um, I think it's the dumbest decision the USGA has ever decided to do. It's stupid. I'm sorry. I mean, so what if I hit the ball 330? So what? You know, I think and it, it's just not fair. It's stu- it's I honestly think it's really dumb. I mean, if you look on on tour, you know, you have only a couple guys that hit it 340, 350 and, and we're talking about like Scotty Scheffler, Rory McIlroy, all those guys and I think a lot of the tour pros have even been saying like, "Hey, like what do you think we were going to do?" like to sit here and be couch potatoes like no we're gonna be athletes we're gonna look like athletes we're gonna work out like athletes like if you look at tiger from let's say 96 98 i mean he was a skinny little thing and he comes out in the early 2000s and just this ripped massive man you know and he's bombing these guys 30 40 yards so it's stupid and then if you look at from a genetic or a biological standpoint you know a guy who's six eight six six is going to hit the ball further than someone who's five five or five four so what are you going to do like oh if you're six foot you have to no that's just how that life was dealt so being having to give up yards to make it a tougher golf course it doesn't make any sense if you look at the at the u.s open alone those are some of the hardest golf courses that they make it impossible to play like if the three of us went out there and played, I would probably definitely shoot like a 98 of how difficult that golf course would be. Yeah. So I think the USGA is making a terrible decision. It's a dumb decision. Just keep the golf courses the way they have. And I think they've done a great selection in these past U.S. Opens and these past U.S. Amateurs and these U.S. A- and these U.S. Uh, juniors to where these kids and these amateurs and these pros have to showcase their abilities. They have to be the number one percent and that is what the usga was looking for or is continue to look for who is the top dog in these conditions and they should leave it like Mm -hmm. that and uh rod you mentioned that they want to make the driver head 430 cc uh sorry usga there's already drivers out there that are 430 ccs i mean you look at the tsr three four the four is even smaller i think it's like 390 my driver, which is a 430 LST, is 430 CCs. You can make it as small as you want. Guess what? We're going to find no, out it, no matter what. He was saying 330, 
like three super dramatic, like a mini, like a mini driver, like the Taylor. <laughs> yeah. I mean, kind of going, mean, going really old school. Yeah. It won't. It doesn't matter. We're gonna find the middle of the face. I mean, wh- what do you think? Yeah. Like you're like right. Martin you can you can go yeah. back and look. We'll, we'll find you can it. go back and look at old school drivers, and they were small. I mean, I yeah. I don't know the CCs, but they were very. You know, when you look at the first Big Bertha. It was still pretty much the size of a modern three wood at this time. Mm-hmm. You, you get a lot of stuff out of this channel, y'all. A little business knowledge, you know, a little technical golf knowledge, a little BS in here and there. You're you're in a well rounded environment. <laughs> so uh, hit that subscribe button, hit that membership button. Um, we got you covered on all things golf.